Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we are going to discuss the 2 plus 2 summit which was held between the United States and India in New Delhi recently. We have with us D. Raghunandan to discuss the issue. Raghu, what it appears is that India seems to have made a U-turn, if you will, from what it was getting towards in Wuhan and Sochi later, which was a more uh, independent foreign policy back to what it was before say the 2014 or the earlier period when India used to talk about the geostrategic autonomy. But with this, particularly signing of the Comcasa agreement and no other uh, change in the relation between India and the United States, whether it's Iran sanctions, whether it is the S-400 issue, whether there is a trade issue or even what always in Indian discussions comes up, the visa issues regarding the uh, business visas that India wants the United States to extend. This seems to have been almost a one-sided uh, accession by India to US demands that India signs the Comcast agreement. This communication agreement uh, is in some sense a demand that US has been making for a long time. Do you see anything that uh, is that India has got out of the summit apart from conceding the Comcasa? See, I think that uh, the Wuhan and uh, similar moves meant to allay Chinese fears. Uh, I'm not sure that I would see it so much as a U-turn as that I think there were apprehensions in Russia, in China in particular, that India's pro-US tilt was becoming so sharp and pronounced that India felt the need to appease uh, anxieties uh, in China. To allay the anxieties. Uh, to allay the anxieties. Uh, that having been done, I think India has now reverted to its uh, position of uh, throwing all its eggs into the uh, US basket. Now, in terms of what India has got out of this, uh, I think if you weigh the pros and cons, I think India has given away more than it has got. Uh, in the sense that India has already acquired a fair number of US weapons systems. Uh, the P-8I reconnaissance uh, aircraft, the transport aircraft, the C-17 and the C-130 Hercules. Now all of these are currently operating with uh, bought out commercially available communications and security uh, hardware and software. Now clearly if you wanted to maximize the potential of these uh, systems, you need to upgrade the ComSec the uh, communications and security hardware uh, on these systems. To do that, they have now acquired the American systems, which has necessitated uh, signing of the Comcasa. In fact, the buying spree which India had entered into for US armaments uh, virtually has presupposed India signing on to the Comcasa. And many commentators have been warning uh, that the increasing stepped up purchases of US hardware by India would mean entering into the strategic embrace of the US rather than just being one off transactions. Let's look at the Comcast agreement itself. Yes. What it means, of course, is that India gets access, as you said, to, shall we say, more souped up American hardware in right. terms of communication equipment. Right the ability to use this, whatever the military hardware it is bought, better. Yeah. But the converse is also true that the United States gets access to all this equipment, even if it is in Indian hands, right. because the software really drives this. Right. And the software, the back doors, whatever the integration with the American systems are, ensure that the United States will know exactly where all these are positioned, A. And B, push comes to shove they have the ability to disable this equipment if it wants. Absolutely. And this is something which will always mean that there is a back door open, Absolutely. as it were, to American Absolutely. Indian equipment. And that's what I was uh, suggesting when I said India is losing more. 
pro-U.S. commentators, those who have been salivating at the prospects of uh, India acquiring sophisticated U.S. Uh, equipment, have been making much of the fact that Comcasa will now enable India to tap into U.S. communications and intelligence uh, systems, that India will have access to real-time intelligence uh, from the U.S. systems. But these commentators forget the fact that this is at the pleasure of the United States. And the United States can always cut off uh, the supply of such uh, intelligence, may not share this intelligence with uh, India, can code the information in such a way that India does not uh, access. That's one part of it. So you enter into a strategic uh, embrace with the U.S., assuming that you have access to a large pool of information, but forgetting that this is at the beck and call of the uh, U.S. And second, the point that you uh, mentioned is the intrusive nature of the U.S. role once you've got this equipment. Uh, we don't know the exact details of the agreement signed with India, which is supposed to be India-specific. But if you look at similar agreements signed with other U.S. military allies, the U.S. has retained the right to inspect this equipment. It has sole right for servicing and maintenance of this equipment, including the coding of the software. Uh, none of this is in Indian uh, uh, hands. This is way beyond end-use monitoring of the equipment. This is actual on-site inspection, repair, maintenance, which means access to all military facilities of India, wherever such equipment is being used, including, by the way, the Andaman uh, Integrated Command, where a lot of this equipment is also going to be made available. Other part of it, India had an interest to see that the United States does not impose sanctions on oil issue, which is the Iran issue. India is now going to still buy Iranian oil yes. using Iranian tankers and this will not be denominated in dollars. Right. The S-400 is still being opposed. Yes. The United States has still threatened uh, sanctions if India goes ahead with it. And interestingly, both these were announced by Pompeo in the US Embassy, not during the summit. Right. And we have absolutely no softening of the US stand Absolutely. on the trade issue where they have said trade has to be balanced. Now here is the issue that it is not a question of what India needs or doesn't need, or what US needs or doesn't need. It is that it has to be entirely reciprocal in terms of quantity, in terms of money. Right. Now those are things which are completely outrageous and is not a part of, shall we say, the GATT or the WTO arrangement. Right. But this was not the basis of the trade. In fact, if India thought that entering into this kind of strategic alliance with the U.S. will give India a lever and a leg up in foreign policy relations while retaining uh, a degree of sovereignty and independence, it's very much mistaken because no U.S. ally, NATO uh, not accepted, the U.K., Germany, uh, Japan and the Koreas, Australia, no country has been given exceptional treatment by the United States. Pax Americana runs. It doesn't matter whether there's a UN resolution or not. The United States has commanded its coalition allies to enter the war in Afghanistan, to enter into operations in Iraq and in many other theaters uh, around the world. And it doesn't matter what sensitivities are involved. If the United States could do this with 70-year-old allies going back to the Second World War, Johnny come latelys like India are not going to be able to shift the US. And I think it was very remarkable that no concessions were made by the US to Indian sensitivities with regard to Russian equipment being bought uh, for India. More than 60% of India's military hardware is of Russian origin. And if you are prevented today from buying S-400s, there's nothing to suggest that tomorrow 
you will not be further prevented from buying Russian hardware, which means you are being perforce forced into a position where you will buy more and more uh, US uh, hardware. So even if Trump had not blackmailed you into balancing uh, the payments, uh, you would head in that direction anyway by this compulsion to buy more US military equipment. It's also interesting that Shushma Swaraj, our foreign minister, seems to have made defense as the cornerstone of foreign policy, Absolutely. which was never India's foreign policy. It was Absolutely. also always based on not just defense and military issues, but also a different view of the world, Absolutely. which also was talked about, uh, what shall we say, is the emancipatory view of the decolonization project, the colonial uh, or neo-colonial pressures which are being put, all of this is a part of Indian foreign policy. To make right. an entire defense centric is quite new. Right. Last point I would like to uh, take this 2 plus 2, coupling defense with foreign policy. Yes. Do you see this as a big shift in India's foreign policy oh, rather definitely. than defense? Oh, definitely. Uh, two things that I'd like to say with regard to this. The first is that uh, much of this shift to an explicitly pro-US stance was initiated during the first NDA uh, government under then Prime Minister Vajpayee, but cemented during the UPA uh, regime, which entered into the Indo-US defense framework uh, agreement, which in fact has paved the way uh, for all this. And that framework agreement itself makes defense the basis for external affairs, for foreign relations uh, between the two countries. So it's a, uh, a relationship rooted in a defense agreement, which then drives uh, external affairs. That's one. The second point is that having entered into such an agreement, the UPA discovered and listened to many voices from the strategic uh, ecosystem in India, which were warning the government not to enter into much deeper uh, relations with the US, precisely because it threatened Indian sovereignty and independence in decision making. This government, within a matter of three years, has signed the foundational agreements, LEMOA and now uh, COMCASA, is inevitably going to sign BECA and has entered into uh, this formal agreement, which more or less makes India today uh, a designated military ally of the United States, which as we all know, means that you then become part of the US foreign policy establishment and worldview. You know, the Interestingly enough, we also seem to have reiterated our willingness to buy the discredited Westinghouse reactors, which are finding no takers at the moment, even in the United States. Leaving out all of this consideration, it does seem that India is now on a trajectory which is somewhat different from what we had hoped after first the Doklam standoff, then Sochi and uh, Wuhan that there was some thawing of India-China relationship, right. some balancing. We seem to be back on track uh, post Doak Club I'm again. afraid so. Thank you very much, Raghu, for being with us. Do keep watching News Click for further discussion on this and other topics.